Good morning from the Labour Party conference in Liverpool after another week when everything changed. We'll be talking live to the party's leader, Sir Keir Starmer. He has a new opponent. A party he hopes has a new sense of unity after two and a half years in charge. But there are tensions. The Labour Party needs to be really clear. Is it on the side of the establishment or is it on the side of British workers? And Keir Starmer needs answers for a new economy, the one the new Chancellor has promised us all. Mr Speaker, we're at the beginning of a new era. And as we contemplate, and as we contemplate, that's right. An era of massive tax cuts cheered by Tories in the chamber. The markets took a dimmer view. That was the government. This morning, one big question. What would Labour's plans mean for you? I'm joined this morning live in the Museum of Liverpool by Sir Keir Starmer. And from London by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Kwasi Kwarteng. And with me for the next hour is the union leader's leader, Francis O'Grady, the General Secretary of the TUC. Jared Lyons, the economist who's been informally advising Liz Truss on some of our new economic plans, and by the managing director of Iceland, the supermarket chain, Richard Walker. Good morning and a very warm welcome to you from Liverpool. It seems so much is in flux this week, we can't possibly cram it all in. But we want to have an honest conversation with our guests about the economy, about three things. About how the government gets its cash, where it spends it and the effect that has on all of us. Now Richard, through your business you're in contact with thousands of customers every day. A lot said about it being a tough time already. What's your experience of what's going on in the real economy? Yeah, absolutely. A, a thousand shops serving five million customers a week, and uh, some of them are really struggling. They were struggling before this cost of living crisis. Uh, now, you know, you, you can only think um, as, as bills are going up. So um, we see and feel and hear that on a daily basis. Stories of you know customers leaving uh, items at, at the uh, at the till and telling the cashier uh, when to stop. You know, when it gets to a certain certain amount. We've got things like shoplifting on the rise, um, people looking for, for value ranges. Um, so it is, it, you know, it's very real and it's going to get tougher as we get into the winter months. Now the government this week has come up with a very, very significant package of measures to try to improve the economy. We can take a look at the front pages this morning, which of course are looking in detail at what's been announced. I think we can look on the front page of the Telegraph and the Express, both talking about the economy. The Express says, Chancellor, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, the Sunday Times suggests suggesting that Liz Truss might also ease up on immigration. The Observer focusing fully on Keir Starmer's plan for green energy and jobs, and we'll hear plenty of that from him too. But the Mail and the Sun um, talking about Prince Harry. But our focus this morning is on the economy. And Jared, you're a believer in the new government's approach. You've spoken to Liz Truss a lot about her plans, although you weren't directly involved this week. Most economists have been saying in the last few days that the government's plans for waves of tax cuts are a gamble. Do you accept that it is a gamble? Well, it's not a gamble. In fact, tax cuts, while they've received a lot of attention, are just a tiny part of the overall package. The bulk of the changes on Friday were actually reversing previously announced tax increases, national insurance, which all economists call a tax on jobs, and reversing the previously announced a corporation tax increase. Basically, the world economy is slowing, the UK economy is slowing, Western Europe, including the UK, has been really hit hard by the consequences of the war in Ukraine. And on top of that, the UK economy, like Western Europe, has been in a slow growth phase since the global financial crisis. What we are now finally seeing is really two things from the new government. One, an attempt to stop the current situation getting worse by having an energy price cap and reversing those tax increases. And then on top of that, having the redirection to a pro-growth economic strategy. And what was really interesting on Friday was that business, Institute of Directors and the CBI really endorsed the package the financial markets were a bit wary. We'll probably talk about that later. A bit wary is the understatement, <laughs> yeah. I think, already. It's Francis, here. Well, is, is the other description. I mean, nobody's going to say no to free money. And I think well, it's not free money. Uh, <laughs> business 
leaders uh, may well be uh, lauding the budget, but everybody else is saying that this is a reverse Robin Hood. This is about uh, benefiting the rich and wealthy corporations at the expense of ordinary people with no plan as to what this means for funding our hard-pressed NHS or, or public services. And it's on top of 10 years of real wages, either stagnating or being cut. So people are pretty angry, I think, that of all the priorities, the government has chosen to put the wealthy first. And we'll talk about that later with um, Kwasi Kwarteng, the Chancellor, but first we're going to talk to Keir Starmer of Francis. What's top of your list to hear from the Labour leader? I mean, there's always tensions between the union movement and the Labour Party, but what do you want to hear? Well, I think we now have a very clear dividing line. It's very clear whose side the government is on. It's on the side of the wealthy. That's the big message from that mini budget. I think working people want to hear that Labour is on our side. Labour's going to really fight not just for decent incomes, decent livelihoods and jobs, but workers' rights. Uh, again, we're hearing that the government is going to re review those uh, rights at work that have been derived from the EU. Is Labour really going to fight for working people and stand up for decent jobs? And Richard, brief thought from you. Labour wants to be business friendly. I suspect we might hear that in a couple of minutes. What would you like yeah. to hear? Well, I want to know the detail. I want to know how. You know, what's going to happen for taxes for my customers, for business, to regulation. Um, there's some bold ambition and strategy, but, but how are we going to get there? OK, thank you all for now. Hard work for you later to come in the programme, so don't go anywhere. Um, listening to that is Sir Keir Starmer. Welcome to the programme. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, First of all, what do you expect the next few months will be like? You know, we heard from Richard that customers are already having things very difficult. Look, we're in a very serious situation when it comes to our economics, a very fragile situation. We're going into a very, very difficult winter. And what Richard described is exactly what I've had described to me by some of his customers and others, going to the supermarket, looking at the price of food and having to put it back down again. So it's a very fragile situation, a very serious situation for our economy. It's on the back of 12 years of Tory failure. We've had um, an economy that hasn't really grown very much for 12 years. We've had wages which haven't really moved for 12 years because they've taken the wrong decisions. They haven't planned for the future. And now we've got um, this decision on Friday um, to take a very risky approach to the future, um, driven by this ideology, this argument, wrong-headed argument in my view, that if you simply allow the rich to get richer, somehow that money will trickle down into the pockets of uh, all the rest of us. It didn't work last time. It is wrong-headed, and it's completely the wrong way to approach well, what is well, going we'll to talk, be a very, we'll, very we'll difficult talk about winter. The, the later, and, and you're here in Liverpool, and we're here yeah. in Liverpool to hear about your plans. Now, before we talk about your long-term plan for energy, we know that where people are really feeling the rub now is with their energy bills. Yeah. Now, the government's promised to freeze for two years. Would Labour do that? Well, we'll freeze for six months was our plan. We, we were very clear um, in the summer that this was going to be a very difficult winter. Energy prices were going to go up, predicted to go up to, you know, £3,000, £4,000, uh, money that people couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. So we were very straightforward to say we've got to freeze those prices. We won't allow those increases to but come in. Now, at the months. time, of course, the government said they wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. We made the argument. Mm -hmm. They've now accepted that's the only thing to do. The divide now, the real question, the political question is who is going to pay no, for that No, hang on. Freeze? There's another question first. You're promising a freeze for six months. The government's promising a freeze for two years. So will you increase your offer well, to freeze bills for, for two years? Our plan is for six months. Obviously, uh, in April, that? we have to look at what the situation is, see what the forecasts are then. And we we need to have a longer term answer to this. But, 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 the, but, but Laura, the, the key issue at the moment is mm -hmm. who is going to pay for this freeze? The, the key issue Whether for many people listening to you this morning, Chris years. Starmer, I think might be that the government's promised they'll freeze my bills for two years. The Labour leader's promising you'll freeze them for six months. And then, well, after that, we'll have a look. No, no, no. So if you people, talk to people need to people know about now? This, people say, I'm very glad um, that my bills won't be going up. I do want to know who's paying for it. Am I going to pay in the long run? Or is somebody else going to pay? 
And when they learn that the oil and gas companies in the North Sea have made excess profits of altogether, all take energy included, 170 billion there, pounds. There this is, is profits they didn't expect to make, and the government says we're not going to line. touch that. In the end, we're going to make taxpayers pay. And there is a difference. I think most, a vast majority of people I speak to say that is wrong. What on earth are they doing? There's this excess profit but, but there on the table, about, and they won't and touch you're, it. You're, you're right to say there's a difference in how the policy would be paid for. But there is also, as you said this morning, there's a very clear difference. Labour is saying right now we would freeze until April. The government is saying we would freeze for two years. So what are people meant to think about the support that you would provide for them after April? Don't they need to know now? Because actually, a Labour Party is providing less reassurance no, no, Laura, look, for people who are struggling to pay their bills. We've set out a plan for the next six months, fully costed, and we've explained um, exactly how it works, a price freeze, and to be paid for, um, including to be paid for by the excess oil that? and tax profits. After that, of course, we need another plan. I don't shy away from that, but we need to know what the forecasts are. We didn't put our plan on the table until the middle of August because we needed to know exactly what the forecasts were for this winter. Nobody knows the forecast for next April. But the need, does the Would need to be... Would you do it again? Does the need to be a medium and long-term answer to this? Yes, there does. Um, you know, the government has said a two-year freeze. We've said six months freeze. But we've got to take a step back here because what we've seen with this government for 12 years is short-term, 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 react to a crisis, react to a crisis. We need to do much more ambitious things. At our conference last year, we're in Brighton then, um, I said we need a mission, a national mission, to insulate homes. 19 million of our homes are leaking energy, so they're paying their bills and leaking the energy. If the government had taken me up on that mm -hmm. last year, two million homes would have been insulated by now. And, and I've and seen uh, some of these homes in Kirklees. I went to see the council there as insulated homes. You go in, I went there on a freezing day, it's warm, the bills of those living in the homes are next to nothing and they're grinning from ear to ear. So I would say we do need a fix for this winter, of course we do, but we've got to start fixing the longer term and, and issues. And we will talk about that, but our viewers this morning will have heard that you are not at this point willing to guarantee freezing people's bills beyond April. And you've, and you've made that well, very look, clear. Look, we'll have to see in April what the situation is. Okay. But look, in terms of who's been leading on this. The Labour Party in January argued for a windfall well, let, tax. Let's talk about your in August, plan. we, made the, we, we and, put and the proposition you, of freezing bills. Made, so we're actually the party that's coming up with the ideas and okay. others are following. Well, let's talk about some of your long-term ideas then. Your big pitch this week is that you say 100% of the ele electricity we use by 2030 will be carbon free. Now, lots of people might hear that and think that's a laudable aim. How on earth are you going to make that happen? Well, we need to double onshore wind, we need to triple solar, and we need to quadruple offshore wind. We need to partner with business, but the prize here is, and it's going to be difficult, the prize here is huge, which is lower prices um, in the longer run, lower prices for people on the bills that they're going to pay, which is crucially important. And this isn't for the short term, this isn't a short term fix. This is a mission that would actually bring those bills down. And I'm sure people listening would say, if you've got a plan that by 2030 means my bills will be down and stay down, then I want to hear that plan. But also, it's also about energy security because it'll make us less reliant on the international market, which is what's driving those prices at the moment. But on Friday, for example, our wind power fleet was operating at 15% of its potential capacity because it, it, it wasn't windy. Now, how do you keep the lights on if we don't have fossil fuels to fall back on? Because what you're talking about is an ambition of achieving that in six years. If you win the election in 2024, you're saying you could do this all by 2030. Look, of course it's uh, an ambition. It's absolutely doable. It's going to be difficult. Of course it's going to be difficult. But one of the problems that we face is that over the last 12 years, the government hasn't done this. So if you come to uh, wind turbines, mm. they've as good as stopped onshore wind turbines in 2015. But this is about how you would make this happen yeah, between we would 2024 drive it and, and, and 30 if you do that. Now, if renewables aren't reliable enough to provide 100% of electricity. I mean, no, nobody would think at this stage in the game, what do you fall back on? How do you keep the lights on? Well, you'd always have a transition with oil and gas. Of course you would. But we've got to have the ambition to get off fossil fuels when it comes to our power. This is a plan that can be delivered. It's a plan which will drive down our prices. And it's a plan that if the government had set off this on this road, um, you know, five, six years ago, we wouldn't be in the position we're in. 
But in terms of what you're saying, though, are you absolutely adamant that there would be no reliance on fossil fuels by 2030? Or is it still there as a fallback? Well, it might be there as a fallback. It might be there as a fallback, right. The the plan is 2030, um, you know, for all of our power, clean power. And we think that you can double onshore wind power, triple solar and quadruple offshore wind power. It can be done. We need a government that is prepared to partner with business on an ambition that can be turned into a result in 2030. And that's what we've not had. We've got a government. You saw it on Friday, this idea that, you know, the mission is make the rich richer and somehow the money trickles down. But also this idea that what business wants at the moment is government to get out of the way. I fundamentally disagree with that. All the businesses I talk to say, what we need here is a government with a clear strategy, the certainty to allow us to invest um, and to partner us along the journey um, with the certainty that allows us to make key decisions um, and, you know, sets a strategy we can all agree on. And that's what's been missing for the last 12 years. Well, They're not then... saying to make here, I want a government that gets out of the way. Well, let's They're then... saying we want a grown-up well, we'll, government that sits alongside us. I will be us. talking to Kwasi Kwarte and the Chancellor later in the programme. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the decisions that businesses and public services are having to make now. One of the biggest decisions they have to make, how to pay their workers. Should people in this country be able to expect their pay to rise in line with inflation? Well, look, uh, of course people want their pay to go up. Wages have been... Well, let me just... um, Wages have been stagnant for 10 years um, or so. Prices are going up, and therefore it is completely understandable that so many people want their wages to go up to match. What I've said, what we've said, is we get the Low Pay Commission to set the living wage... um, not just by reference to the median wage, but also by reference to the cost of living, so that you lock in for the long term an increase uh, in the living wage, which takes account of the cost of living. And that's the mechanics of how you might do it if you... But it's very important, Laura, because that locks it in to the cost of living. But this is also a question of political principle. At a time like this, inflation is around 10%. Should people expect their pay to rise in line with that? It's a, it's a principal question, because at one end, you've got teachers getting an offer of around yeah. 5%. Nurses are asking for 12.5%. What's reasonable in your view? Well, look, it's reasonable for people to want a pay rise. And each of the trade unions involved in negotiating is negotiating the best deal that they think is right for their members in the particular sector. It's not for me to wade in and say, I think it should be this amount or that amount. That is the process that they're going through. So it's reasonable but, to expect it. If but they the, don't, but the, is it reasonable to go on strike? It is reasonable to expect that um, wages are set taking account of the cost of living which is going up. And that's what we will put in through the Low Pay Commission. That is a reasonable thing. But right now, do you back people going on strike if they do not get pay rises in line with inflation? Well, look, um, when people go on strike, it is a last resort um, at the end of negotiations. And I can quite understand um, how people are driven to that. They're really struggling to pay their bills. Um, The negotiations have not succeeded and they've taken, as a last resort, the decision to go on strike. And I support um, the right of individuals to go on strike. I support the trade unions doing the job that they are doing in representing their members. Um, I want to see the strikes resolved, as do everybody Mm -hmm. who is on strike. They disrupt the public, but they're also, you know, they hurt the people on strike because they're not being paid. you're backing people going on strike when they are. Why aren't you then, and some of your team, more visible on this? Why are you not allowing people to go to picket lines if they're part of your top team? And I just want to play the audience and for you to hear as well. There's a strike down the road, yeah. some of the dockers here, and let's hear what they wanted from you. Keir Starmer should be here today. What's going on? What I'd like to do is show solidarity with every single worker in Britain, every single working class person in Britain. If he doesn't start solidarity, the working class is just going to leave the Labour Party alone. Now, you have been clear you don't want your shadow members of your shadow cabinet to be on picket lines. But here there's a clear call from workers at Peel Ports down the road. They've rejected an 8.3 rise and a one-off payment of £750. They want you there. So explain to them and the audience why it's not right in your view for you to go. The single most important thing I can do for everybody who is on strike today, everybody who's struggling to pay their bills, uh, is to usher in a Labour government. Because when we do that, we can have day one employment rights for every single person, including those we've just seen on the clips. 
rights in statute and a way of settling pay disputes with pay, pair, pay, fair pay agreements. So the single most important thing I can do as leader of the Labour Party is to make sure that we have a Labour but government. why shouldn't that include being there yourself? Look, I've worked with the trade unions all the time. I've got a long history mm -hmm. in our party of that link with the trade union mm -hmm. movement and it will be long into the future, that strong link. My job is to uh, discuss this with trade union leaders as I do on a daily basis, understand the disputes, understand what's behind the disputes. But my job as leader of the Labour Party is not the same job as the leader of a trade union. My job is to make sure that we get the Labour Party from opposition, where we can just say things but not do things, into power where we can do things. And the two things I would do um, to anybody who's struggling with their bills or anybody who's in industrial action today, the two things that we would do is we would absolutely deal with the cost of living crisis because we have got a plan for growth, which is actually uh, a sustainable plan for growth to deal with the cost of living crisis because that's what lies behind these disputes, but also to give those who are working, our working people, the rights that they desire at work. And well, they heard from the Chancellor on Friday what well, he intends talk, to do, I, which is to strip their rights away. Well, that's how, how you would frame it. But well, let, that's what he let, said. Let's talk about some of the other things the Chancellor announced then. So he announced some big changes on tax. If you were in office, would you reintroduce the top rate of tax, the 45p rate that the government scrapped? Would you put it back up? Yes. What about... I do not think that the choice um, to... Um, have tax cuts for those that are earning hundreds of thousands of pounds is the right choice when our economy is struggling the way it is, working people are struggling in the way they are, and our public services are on their knees. So further? it is the wrong choice. Would that is the up, wrong choice. Would you go up I would reverse the decision that they made on Friday. But, Be absolutely clear about that. The effect of that decision was if you're earning a million pounds, mm -hmm. You got £55,000 in tax cuts uh, as a result of that decision on Friday. That's enough, more than enough, to employ a nurse. I don't think many people watching this programme will say that is fair, that is the way to grow our country. It is hugely risky, it's hugely divisive, and I would reverse it. And would you support the government cutting the basic rate of income tax from 20p down to 19p? Yes, I've long made the argument uh, that we should... Reduce the tax burden on working people. Um, it's why we um, opposed the national insurance mm -hmm. uh, increase earlier this year, which, of course, the government is now uh, reversing. So, uh, no, we wouldn't reverse that. OK, so you would, not, you would stick with the 19p, you would stick with the cut to national insurance. On that money to national insurance, that was intended specifically to fund social care, though. So if you're not getting that 13 billion from there, how else would you find social care? Fund well, social I listened care? very carefully to what the Chancellor said on Friday because he was asked that very question, does mm -hmm. this mean that that money now won't be used for the NHS but where would and you for find social it? care? Where would no, you but his, find answer was, his answer was that the decision he took on Friday will not affect the money that's being made available to the NHS. So that means an incoming Labour government would inherit a situation where that money has been paid by this government through general taxation. So that's actually, he carefully answered that and I leant forward and listened to what he was saying there. Um, and he but says your that answer well is it would just come out of general taxation then you wouldn't have a specific tax position. Well Laura, when we get to the election we'll obviously set out exactly how we'll cost okay. everything. But okay. on well, that let... question he was very careful to say that money is not now okay. being taken away. Okay, well, let's talk about your path to that election. This is your third conference in person, and you've, you've seen off one Prime Minister. You've got another one now to contend with. You seem quite, quite, quite chipper. You know, when you took this job, the Labour Party was broken. People were saying there was no way back for you over one term. Where do you think things are at now? Well, um, what I'm seeing increasingly is people looking to the Labour Party to provide the answers to the challenges that we've got. I see a very big political divide because you've got the Conservative Party now saying uh, the future of this country is one where the rich get richer and we offer nothing meaningful to working people. You've got the Labour Party saying we do need to grow our economy. That's been the single biggest failure of the last 12 years of this Tory government. But we need to recognise who grows this economy. It is those people, the software workers, those working in the factories, those in our schools training people, those in our hospitals keeping people going. They're the people who really grow the economy and they're entitled to benefit from that growth. So I would grow the economy from the bottom up and the middle out to reflect the reality of our country and those that are really driving the country. But in terms I of do how not, politics has been shifting... I do not do believe you... in this theory that it's only those at the very top, the very wealthy, that create uh, and drive our economy. It's the 
working people across the in, country who have built where you're and grow our economy. In terms of that, that's your, that's your argument. But in terms of whether or not you think you're persuading people, I heard that you said you do think you're beginning to persuade people. Are you seeing evidence? Do you see your own evidence that you think you could, that's giving you cause to think you could win? Well, we were very pleased with the local election results in May this year. Um, where we did better than expected and we track that against what we need to do for the next general election. I'm very pleased with the progress that we're making. We then won a by-election in Wakefield, which was very, very significant. But it's more than that, Laura. It's this sense now that people are looking to the Labour Party for the answers to the big challenges of the but future. As you go out and about, you, you can that. feel that sense. People coming up, they want to know. On the windfall tax, every time I've talked to any group of individuals about it, they cannot understand why the government will not... It's going to leave these excess profits on the table. So when, when people understand and recognise that profits which weren't expected, which are only really there because of the conflict in Ukraine, policy, and, and you know, the government you're... says we will not touch it, and I say the Labour Party will put those profits to good work, but do you think that people say, I like that answer, Keir, I think that's common... That's but do you think common that, sense politics, but, but if you, you like. do you think that voters who went from the Labour Party across the Tories in 2019 are coming back to you. Do you see signs that's happening? I do see signs that's happening. And uh, in those local elections, we were tracking the results in the constituencies we need to win. And one of the features was that some people who voted um, Conservative in 2019, who had previously been voting Labour, are coming back to the Labour Party. Now, that's a you know, big step from where we were in 2019. I'm not complacent. Every vote has to be earned. We need to do much more, but um, are we heading in the right, right direction? Yes. And something's happened in the Labour Party this year, which is the hope of a Labour government has turned into a belief in a Labour government. And that change, that switch, is worth its weight in gold. And if you consider where we were in 2019, to now be in a position um, where there's a belief that Labour will win the next general election is real progress for our party. So you sound pleased that you think you're becoming more popular, but Liz Truss interestingly said when she became Prime Minister that she was willing to be unpopular. Can you just lastly tell us one thing that if you become Prime Minister that you would want to do even though it wouldn't be popular? Well, um, the first thing I'd say about Liz Truss is it, this is nonsense. Um, she says she'll do... She's well, this prepared is about you, Keir Starmer. We're, she, we're, we're, but she's we're driving around the country we'll... saying, I don't like the look of solar panels in fields, so I'm not going to do it. That's not being prepared to do well, something unpopular. What would unpopular. you be prepared to do, though, that might make you unpopular? Well, I've done unpopular things already in the Labour Party. There's, over the last two years, I've taken the Labour Party, picked it up off the canvas, um, put it back on its feet, changed the party, made it face um, the public. We had to do really tough, unpopular things within the party to do that. You've seen that. This time last year at Labour Party conference, people are saying, whoa, what are all these rule changes? Keir's going too far, he's going too fast for our party. I said, no, if I need to be unpopular to do it, we'll do it. We've done it. We're now seeing the results because this year, you know, opinion polls go up and down the whole time. Um, but we've seen hard evidence in those votes in the May elections that people are not only looking at Labour again, they're beginning to believe in Labour again. We need to push on from here. There's more to do. I'm not complacent. Every vote has to be earned. Okay. But we've come a long way. OK, Keir Starmer, thank you very much indeed for coming uh, to talk to us this morning. Ahead of a very busy week for you. Thank you thank so you. much. Um, very interesting. There are lots and lots to talk about. Francis O'Grady. First of all, what did you make of what you heard? It's interesting, Andy Burnham this morning has said that all of the tax cuts should be reversed, but Keir Starmer didn't quite go there. What did you make of what he said? Well, I thought we heard very clearly from Keir Starmer that he's uh, determined to have a progressive tax system that everybody should pay their fair share, including uh, corporations like Amazon and wealthy individuals. But I thought what was interesting was a very confident outlining of a, what a Labour government would do for working people, that we'd have a real living wage instead of a minimum wage, that he would ban zero hours and fire and rehire some of those, you know, awful P&O style uh, employment practices that we've seen in our jobs market. 
Um, and I think a message, uh, no doubt, he'll be amplifying at conference that the biggest act of solidarity with working people would be to get a Labour government in power. But, but just on that narrow point, because it has got some people excised in the Labour movement, and we heard from those striking workers who wanted to see Keir Starmer down on the picket line. Does it matter to you as a union leader that he is very clear he doesn't think that his, he and his team what, should be doing what that? What matters to me is the fact that we've got workers on strike in the docks who work for a parent company that has uh, got £30 billion pounds of profit this year and they're saying they can't afford to give those workers an inflation-proof pay rise. That, I think, is disgusting. And what we want is a bit of passion and a bit of pointing out that that is plain wrong, that working people deserve a fair share of the cake and some dignity at work. So okay. I, I just want to hear that message of pride in our working people for standing up for decency and pride in our unions for representing them against those sorts of greedy giants who, frankly, are making fools of us all. OK, well, that business isn't here to defend themselves this morning, but you've passed on your message loud and clear. Richard, you wanted detail from Keir Starmer. Did you get it? Yeah, I did, because on the way here, I, I looked at the detailed economic growth plan, and it's 200 words on a, on a website. And um, some of the aspiration is to be applauded, you know, doubling onshore, tripling solar, quadrupling offshore. That's great, but that's not how, that's what. What I want to know is how. How are you going to do it if trickle-down's wrong, therefore tax is going to go up, business won't invest? So to me, I'm, I'm still missing the detail there. So you are still short on some detail. And what about the question of pay rises? I mean, are you going to give your workers an inflationary pay rise? Inflation is so It's high. a really interesting one. We've been voted best big company to work for by our staff uh, twice. Um, and yet now we pay minimum wage. We pay £9.50. I'm not proud of that. And I wish we could pay more. But the reality is to pay £10.90, the real living wage, would cost us £50 million. And so, that's money so we don't have. So you won't give them an inflation matching pay rise? We'll, we're going to have to give them as, as, as big a pay rise as we can possibly afford, but it's what you do around it. Headline pay rise, fine, but then you don't want to destroy workers' rights by moving to zero hours contracts, which we don't do, or paying people under the age of 25 less, which we don't do. So you've got to look at it in the round as well. Okay, Joe, um, Keir Starmer said there that getting rid of the top rate of tax, the 45p, was wrong and that he would put it back up. What did you make of that? And do you think, why do you think it's unpopular? Well, in terms of the top rate of tax, that was the one thing I was surprised by in terms of the package on Friday. But the reason I assume the government did that was because of tax simplification. What the government needs to do in terms of, uh, in terms of workers is actually address fiscal drag that so many people have pulled into higher tax brackets. So people, whether they like it or not, get yeah. pulled into higher tax rates. And also, when you go above 50,000, your a child benefit is taken away and therefore you go on to a really high marginal rate of tax. Same happens if you're lucky enough to earn over 100,000. So tax simplification is the big issue. But I think the key issue on Friday was the idea of basically not just in terms of the tax measures, but actually helping people by growing the economy in particular. What I thought was quite interesting on the uh, living wage part was I was surprised he didn't mention the real living wage uh, group that on Friday announced the change. When I was at City Hall, I was an ambassador for in the London, real living wage. Yeah. So yeah. I was an ambassador for the real living wage. And the national minimum wage, or what they want to call it now, is £9.50. If you're under 23, it's £9.18. But on Friday, the Real Living Wage Foundation said that the real living wage in the country should be £10.90. And if you're in London, £11.95. Now, the great thing about that organisation is it mm. tries to take into account the cost of living, but it's voluntary. What I found at City Hall was when you talk to small firms, they really are on tight margins. They mm -hmm. can't afford to pay that. So the best thing that you can do, therefore, is not to put firms in that difficulty, but by lowering the overall tax breaks well, well, let, across the country. Well, let's talk then about the, about the broader plan, because it was a yeah. dramatic moment on Friday when the Chancellor stood up in the House of Commons, and we'll be talking to him shortly. But he unleashed what some Conservative MPs liked as saying were sort of bold, true Conservatives. It made some other Tory MPs very, very nervous about the extent of what some people see as a gamble. And it's interesting this morning in the economic commentary in the papers, there's a lot of people saying this is risky. A lot of people warning about it. David Smith in the Sunday Times, for example, very um, respected economic commentator, warning the government you cannot do Thatcherism twice learn from history, Liz Truss. But the Telegraph leader, in great contrast, has actually said some of the reaction is hysterical 
But then you have a Nobel Prize winning economist, Nouriel Roubini, warning online that the package of measures actually sends the UK back to the 1970s and potentially en route to an IMF bailout. Now, Jared, if you look at how the markets reacted on Friday, it was red on every trader's screen, the pound down to levels that we haven't seen against the dollar since 1985. Okay, well, in terms of the market's reaction on Friday was not just a reaction to the statement on Friday. On Wednesday, the US Federal Reserve, their central bank, raised interest rates quite aggressively and indicated that they would raise rates further. On Thursday, our Bank of England, which is a self-made credibility gap, did not match the increase in US interest rates and also said that they were going to be selling guilt over next year. By no, I mean, but, we saw it instantly, let, the market's I think it's judgment important. on the statement but I think was it's not important. pretty. OK, I was going to say it's important for the viewers, because they probably don't look at the markets, to appreciate that the dollar is strong across the board. Last week, the Bank of Japan intervened because the yen is at a 40-year low. In India, since mid-July, the head news story for most days has been about the rupee being weak. The dollar is strong across the board. Now, what the markets are reacting to is partly expectations of interest rates. UK interest rates went up half a point in the week to two and a quarter point. The government has ruled out a recession. The market's now expecting How interest rates to go. Rule out a recession? Oh, sorry, the mark. Sorry, let, okay. Ruled out is probably the mark. The government has taken measures to stop the deep recession that the markets were factoring in two months ago. The markets, but the point is really, it's not just Friday. It's also Thursday. The Bank of England, and we need to actually change expectations. What we're seeing is the markets right. are reacting to the fact that interest rates have to go a lot higher. So interest and rates have to go a lot higher. So but that's not that just because of Friday's announcement. Okay, well, this Francis, is a, I think okay. if I was being diplomatic, I would say you're looking quizzical. If I was being I more candid, the, I would say you've been rolling your eyes. This what is you... the economics of Narnia. This <laughs> is about, you know, if you make the rich richer, somehow this will end up in the pockets of ordinary people. We All the evidence is it doesn't. This is a isn't a recipe for growth. It's a recipe for more inequality, more poverty, more hardship. And in the long run, the economy will pay a price for that because if people don't have money to spend in Richard's stalls, mm. then we're all going to be worse off. Richard, what's your view? Yeah, I mean, look, um, I, we, we do need to go for growth. We do need to sort out our, our terrible productivity issue. And therefore, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of a lot of the supply side um, agenda. However, um, when I look at my customers, we mm -hmm. talked about it at the start, mm -hmm. if there was more that could be done for them, you know, reinstating that £20 a week universal credit uplift, for example, um, I think that would be a, a really positive thing for them just mm -hmm. to get them through this really, really tricky time. Okay, just before we talk to Kwasi Kwarteng, the Chancellor, about all of this, I just want to raise one other story. Um, let's look at someone else making the news this morning. Liz Truss's Chief of Staff, Mark Fulbrook. Now, there's a story in the Sunday Times about how he's being paid. The accusation is that it's through his lobbying company and that changes his tax status. Now, a spoaksman for him has said it's not unusual, there's nothing wrong with it, it's denied there's a problem. Francis, what it's, do you make of that? It's very unusual to have the chief of staff at the heart of government in number 10 paid through his lobbying company. Now, he's saying it's not about tax avoidance. Well, we'd all like to be the judge of that, but of course it's not even transparent. Uh, everybody else's wages are published, his aren't. What is going on? I would have thought number 10 knew that it had to clean up its act after the last lot, uh, but it sounds like we've got some murky business going on okay. at the heart well, of number 10. To be 10. clear, they've denied there's anything wrong, but I suspect there'll be some more action on this story in the next few days. Thank you all very much for now. Well, let's talk about a lot of that with Kwasi Kwarteng, who's been the Chancellor for 19 days, and he's made a series of changes, the effects of which could last for decades. He's with us from our London studio. Good morning to you, Chancellor. Good morning, Laura. Good morning, Laura. Now, you've said we are facing a very difficult winter. What do you mean by that? Well, I think energy bills <clears throat> are what people are really concerned about. And we were looking at a, a, a winter next year, particularly, where energy bills could go up to an average of £6,500. Now, that's not going to happen. It was never going to happen because we've intervened uh, in, and the Prime Minister announced the intervention two weeks ago. Uh, and we're going to limit uh, that cost to £2,500 for the average household. That's a huge intervention. And actually, most of the uh, fiscal uh, uh, event on Friday, that I, uh, the statement I made, was uh, centred on this energy intervention. I think that was crucially important. And it'll protect our people uh, against uh, very, very high 
uh, electricity prices and, and energy prices. But even at that frozen price, it will still be difficult for many people. And Chancellor, in the hours after your statement, we saw the pound fall to its lowest level in many, many years. The stock markets fell and, crucially, the cost of government borrowing went up too. Now, we can look at the chart of what actually happened almost as, as soon as you opened your mouth. Are you nervous about the economic reaction to what you had to say on Friday? What I'm focused on, Laura, is very much growing the economy. As Richard said on the programme, we've got to grow the economy. We've got to have a much more front-footed approach to growth. And that's what my Friday statement uh, was all about. I think that if we can get some of the uh, reforms that Richard was talking about, if we can get business uh, back on its feet, we can get this country moving and we can grow our economy. And that's what uh, my focus is 100% about. But as the man who's the steward of our economy, of how we all make our living, of how the government pays its way, you must have been nervous, surely, when you saw that kind of reaction. I've always been focused on uh, the uh, longer term and the medium term. And I think it was absolutely necessary that we had a, a long term a growth plan. Uh, I haven't heard anything uh, about a growth plan from Labour. I think it was 200 words on a website. But we're very, very focused on making sure that people get more of their own, uh, keep more of their own money. And what was unacceptable and unsustainable was the idea that we were going to have a 70 year tax high. Uh, tax being a 70, uh, 70 years, uh, uh, a 70 year high, and that we could continue simply raising taxes. That was unsustainable. And, we will, and something and we will had to change. And I'm very pleased and we, and, and that we changed that. And we will talk that. about that. But our viewers will have seen very dramatically what happened in response to your fri statement on Friday directly. What happens if the pound continues to slide like that? So what you know is that as Chancellor of the Exchequer, we don't, I don't uh, comment on market movements. Uh, what I am focused on is growing the economy and making sure that Britain is an attractive place uh, to invest uh, and so that it's a competitive uh, global uh, arena. Uh, and we have to show uh, that this country is open for business uh, and that we're driving growth. And that's what, Friday, uh, what my Friday statement was all about. But if people aren't nervous about what happened, they might be confused because the Bank of England are trying to cool the economy down by raising interest rates. You've cut billions and billions of pounds of tax, which is going to heat things up. You're putting money into the economy while the bank's trying to calm things down. Now, that's confusing, isn't it? Well, How's that going to work? There are two different things here. Firstly, the bank is responsible for monetary policy, which is interest rate movements, and uh, they're tasked to deal with inflation. Uh, and I'm speaking and working closely with the governor on that. And he's independent and he's making decisions. But the second thing, in terms of the uh, uh, fiscal approach, that you mentioned uh, has to be put into a context. We had two multi-generational uh, unprecedented events. We had the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which emerged uh, at the beginning of 2020. And we also had uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, where he's essentially tried to blackmail Europe and, and turn off gas supply. There's no way that a government uh, couldn't have respond, shouldn't uh, respond in a fiscally uh, uh, ex expansive way uh, in a way that we could support the economy, support our people through these two unprecedented shocks. They're things, they're once in a hundred year events. I mean, the, the COVID pandemic was a once in a hundred year event and Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a once in a 70 year uh, event. And we had to respond Explain in a generous way to put, those. Put money to help to people events. pay with their bills. But aren't you worried though about the impact of your wave upon wave of tax cuts which will put money into the economy you're not worried about inflation I mean, because you say the bank of England is independent that's absolutely correct but they don't work in isolation from the rest of the economy and they're deeply worried about inflation are you not so they, they, they don't work in isolation and that's why I uh, have said that I will see the governor uh, twice a week and we, we share ideas but of course he's completely uh, independent but in terms of uh, our approach there was no way that we were going to get uh, more growth by simply increasing taxes and taking more of people's money. Uh, and that was the response that the Prime Minister and I uh, debated. We talked about it and we thought we've got to change uh, tack. We've got to but allow people to keep the more of their... worried about inflation? Their, their, are you worried about how inflation is eating away at everybody's wallet, whether they're a family trying to make ends meet or a business trying to pay their staff and pay for their raw materials? Are you worried about the level of inflation? I'm confident that the bank uh, is dealing with that. But also what perplexed me was the fact that 
You don't deal with people's rising costs of living by taking more of their money in tax. I mean, this was a totally perverse argument. Uh, and no other G7 country is lifting up taxes while dealing with the cost of living. It doesn't make any sense. Now, the big thing that you've done to try to help people with the cost of living is, as you've said, a big intervention to freeze people's energy bills for two years. It's going to cost £120 billion a year to do it. You're borrowing hugely to do that. Is it an open-ended promise? So what I said was that it would cost £60 billion in the first six months. And what you've done is just double that. But, of course, uh, we don't know where the gas prices will be. And I think uh, well, the liquidity higher. scheme... <laughs> the, no, but the liquidity scheme... Uh, that I announced on Friday, which the bank, which we're working with the bank to deliver, means that I think it's likely that the forward, what they call the forward curve, the forward prices, uh, w may well be lower. But there's no way that you or I or anyone else can predict what the cost of that will be. But how much borrowing would be too much? I mean, I suppose the question is really, would you be willing to keep borrowing at that level to keep paying people's bills? Obviously, you, you can't uh, borrow forever, and that's why on Friday... I was very specific, very careful uh, to say that we're going to have a medium-term fiscal plan. But what I am uh, convinced of is that we have two unprecedented shocks to the economy. The COVID-19 pandemic was a once-in-a-hundred-year event, uh, and the uh, invasion, the illegal invasion of Ukraine, was a once-in-an-80-year event, but, but and we you, had to you, respond. You just said there, there Chancellor, and, and as, a, as a Conservative, you just said there that there has to be a limit on borrowing. What is the limit on borrowing? How much well, is too much? All I would say on borrowing is that we've managed to respond to two, uh, what they call exogenous shocks, two things that were, that were not in our control uh, and were of unprecedented scale. And that was absolutely the right thing to do. Obviously, I will be setting out plans uh, for the medium-term uh, fiscal plan, as, as, as we're calling it, uh, that will show uh, that we're committed for, uh, to net uh, uh, debt to GDP to be falling uh, over time. Uh, and but I'll have more details about that. Chancellor, but as, as a Conservative Chancellor, you won't put a limit on borrowing? What I'm, going to do, what I'm, what I'm not going to do, Laura, is to say that if there is a, a, an exogenous, uh, extreme event, uh, I can't possibly uh, say that we, we won't uh, borrow to deal with that. Uh, and that's what we've done. That's why uh, we have uh, borrowed in the way we have. But even after all that, uh, it's, viewers should know that uh, if you look at the G7, the seven countries uh, that are uh, economically uh, at, uh, at, the, at the top, as it were, um, the most advanced economic countries, our net debt to GDP is the second lowest. So the US, France, Japan, all ha Italy, all have far more uh, debt uh, to GDP. Well, but we're disciplined. You sound quite relaxed about that because there are lots of Conservatives who actually look at the cost of borrowing and look at the cost of all of the plans that you announced on Friday and are actually very, very worried about what's going on. But you've made your position very clear. I'm very clear about Most that and I'd like to speak to colleagues about this. I think, um, oh. you know, in a difficult uh, environment, I think we're acting responsibly in our focus on growing the economy and also trying to have a medium term plan. Uh, well, let's to, talk about to, the effects on, on the that then on, on our viewers. And, Let's talk about the effect then on our viewers and, and, and uh, people listening to you this morning. Most people will be worse off as a result of all the changes to income tax and national insurance since the start of this parliament in 2019. Does that matter? I think it does matter. And what we've tried to do, and that's what um, the Prime Minister campaigned on, was that we couldn't have 70-year uh, tax highs. It didn't make any sense. And that's why on Friday I've, I've reversed that. And I want to keep uh, doing that. I want people... As a Conservative, I want people to keep more of their own money. I don't believe, uh, like uh, Labour, that we can just tax our way to prosperity. That's never happened. I really believe that people, businesses, should be allowed to thrive. And that was what Friday was all about. But you've made the choices to give more money back to people at the very top. Is it a good time to be rich in the UK? What I'm focused on is uh, tax cuts uh, across the board. And that's why we brought forward uh, the 1p cut in the basic rate which I'm not sure where Labour, what Labour are going to do about that. I think they, they, Andy Burnham was suggesting that they would reverse that, which imposes more burdens on, on ordinary people. And but that's Hans, why... You just said you wanted to focus it across the board. It is absolutely is right. the case that the changes you have made, the tax cuts you will bring in, favour overwhelmingly people at the very top. They favour people right across uh, the income uh, uh, scale. And that's what's most important. Actually, one of the things that I really did agree with uh, Sir Keir about, is that 
It's British people that are driving economic growth. But many people, most people actually, work in businesses. The interests of, of a small business owner or a small uh, business operator are absolutely aligned with the people who work in those businesses. It's, it's, we but need Jack, to create you jobs. You keep saying this phrase across the board. Only people who earn more than £155,000 will be net beneficiaries of That's what you set true. out. That's not true. I mean, if we look at the fact that That's we since reversed... That's 2019. If you put what you announced on Friday together with what this government has done since 2019, that is the case. So looking at the Friday statement... Uh, we've actually put m more money into people's pockets. That's why we've reversed the national insurance increase, which I, I think uh, was, was not a good policy, and we've reversed that. And also, we're bringing forward uh, the cut in the basic rate. And there's more to come. We've only been here 19 days. I want to see, uh, it, over the next uh, year, people retain more of their income, because I believe that well, it's the British people that are going to drive uh, this economy. And I want, that's why I want well, people to retain more of the uh, income that they, they earn. Well, that's very interesting. So you've made clear that just then that this is just the start. Are you, as not a new government, but a new version of the Conservative government that's been in power for a long time, are you prepared to think what might have seemed unthinkable to your former colleagues if it means the economy gets growing? It's absolutely our focus. The only way that we're going to pay for our public services in the future the only way that we're going to have the kind of economy and society we want is by growing this economy. And that's what I and the Prime Minister and the government are 100% uh, focused on. So let's talk about some specifics then. Would you be prepared to relax immigration rules, for example, if it makes it easier for business to grow? It's not about relaxing rules. The whole point about the Brexit debate, if we want to go down there, was that we need to control immigration in a way that works for the UK. Uh, and that's what uh, the PM and the Home Secretary are totally focused on. But within would the you concept... add jobs, but would you add occupations to the list of um, people who can come in if business are required, if business needs them? So the Home Secretary will be making an update uh, on uh, immigration uh, policy. I flagged that, uh, I, I signalled that on Friday, uh, and she'll be making a statement in the, in the next few weeks. So that but almost absolutely... sounds like a yes, Chancellor. No, no, that it doesn't sound... Like it, it, sounds like, it sounds like <laughs> me saying uh, that, the Prime, uh, that the Home Secretary will make a statement uh, in the next few weeks. But we have to grow okay, this economy. That's... What, what about allowing businesses to ask their staff to work longer hours, perhaps scrapping the working time directive, which restricted the number of hours that people can do? Would that be a good idea if it gets the economy growing? I think, as Laura, we're 100% focused uh, on growing the economy. I, as business secretary, was very uh, clear That's about That's why I'm asking you, if you want to grow the economy, would workers, that help? Uh, would that help workers business rights. get going? And the, uh, the, the, the measures that we had, I thought uh, we might discuss, would be the things that I announced on Friday. Other Cabinet colleagues will be making statements in the next few weeks, uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to ask them about the details of their specific, uh, their specific responsibilities. But it's interesting, you said a few minutes ago that this is just the start, and there is some expectation, a building expectation, that actually you want to be a radical government that will be prepared to do things like scrapping the working time directive, or perhaps relaxing some of the environmental rules, if it means that people can build houses, if it means that young people who are desperate to try and get on the property ladder have got more access to houses being built. We're not going to relax environmental rules. I mean, what the Prime Minister and I have focused on is the process. Uh, too often in this country, there's, the process just takes too long. It doesn't mean that you change the standards, but the actual process of the paperwork and actually getting consents uh, is taking too long. And that, uh, as you'll appreciate, is, a, is an obstacle to growth. We've had uh, uh, a number of years uh, since the Brexit vote, as you know, and I think it's really time now uh, to focus on growing our economy and making sure that uh, growth is in itself uh, is a great thing. But the whole point about it is that we can have the society, the economy, and particularly the public services uh, that we, we expect to see. And that's why uh, I'm passionately concerned about growing this economy. For the vast majority of people watching at home this morning, they had no say in any of these plans because Liz Truss was elected by the Conservative Party rather than by the country. What makes you and her sure that this is what people want, that they want an economy with tax cuts, that they are willing to see the government run up lots of borrowing again? Why do you think the country wants what you're putting forward? I think it was very clear to me uh, that people don't want to see the tax burden going up indefinitely. When you have a tax system, a tax burden today, which is higher than at any time in the last 70 years, 
uh, people begin to worry and business begins to worry and says, what, is the, what are the incentives to activity in this economy? How do we invest and grow? Why should I uh, set up a business or why should I employ people? or Why should I uh, even uh, go to work if I'm being taxed uh, to uh, a very, very high degree? And I wanted to change that uh, narrative. I wanted to change that direction. And I'm very pleased to see that business groups uh, have welcomed a lot of the measures, uh, many of but the measures. But it's very interesting. In, on but, it's very, but it's very striking, though, to hear you use phrases like "this is just the start," "this is just a change of direction," and yet what you and Liz Truss are putting forward is not what Conservative voters chose in 2019. You know, and the number of people who voted for Liz Truss in the Tory leadership contest is roughly the capacity of Aintree down the road on a, on, on race day. Do you feel that you've got the public's permission to go forward with what you clearly believe and are, and are pleased about are a potentially very radical set of changes to the economy and changes to the country? So we have a responsibility in government uh, to protect everybody and to make Britain uh, the best it can be. And I think economic growth is absolutely essential to that. And of course, at the end of the parliament, you know that we live in a parliamentary de uh, democracy, we will uh, be able to go to the electorate and say, this is what we're doing, this is what we've done, this is what we uh, want to uh, create, this is our, our vision, this is how we want to inspire uh, business, inspire people uh, in a great country. And that's what we're focused on. And as you know, in a parliamentary system, we will have a general election uh, in the next two years. Uh, very briefly, Chancellor, just before we close, um, do you know if the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Mark Fulbrook, is being paid through a lobbying company? I and if he is, is that the right thing? I don't know anything about Mark's uh, arrangements. I think he's a great professional. I think he's someone who uh, has enhanced our government. Uh, he's a great uh, person uh, to work with. But I don't know anything about his, uh, uh, how, uh, his remuneration and, and, and how that's organised. OK, Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, thank you so much for talking to us after an extremely busy week for you. And thank we you. hope you come back on the programme soon. Thank, thank you, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Now, I hope we can see each other face to face, as it were. Well, I think we'll, we'll have the programme in Birmingham at the Conservative Party conference okay. next week, of course. We'll be, we'll be there asking questions. Thank you for your Thank time you. this morning. Thank you. Well, a lot in that. Richard, <laughs> what did you make of it? He repeatedly said business was pleased. This is what business wanted. Yeah, and it is pleasing a lot of it. I mean, the, the energy cap for consumers, rightly, is very important, but actually for business mm -hmm. is essential. And I'll give you a real-world example. What levelling up is actually about is jobs on high streets. And all we want to do is open shops, uh, invest in local communities, pay jo uh, create jobs and um, pay tax. And we had to pause all of that because of these wild fluctuations. Now we can restart that because at least we have certainty it's on our energy costs. The other element is about getting government out of the way, contrary to what Keir was saying. Actually, you know, local planning is so bureaucratic and onerous that actually every single one of our 30-year new stores is delayed. Um, because we can't, can't get the permits to open. Jared, are you heartened? Yeah. <clears throat> well, since 2008, the global financial crisis, Western Europe, including the UK, has been in a low growth phase. That low growth phase led the Treasury a decade ago to say to get the finances in shape, austerity was necessary. That was wrong at the time. It led them to say in the same way, because of the low growth, we needed to have tax increases in recent years. That too was wrong. What we now have is Chancellor mm. and Prime Minister say we need a pro-growth strategy. And the key thing about that is it raises the trend rate of growth. Taxes are just part of this. But the key thing you keep asking about the public finances, the, the thing that would have blown the public finances mm -hmm. out of the water would have been if we had a deep recession. And, We're and not going to have a deep recession. That's not but the key now. thing is yeah. it's not just about taxes. It's about investment, innovation, infrastructure. Okay. Renewables and, and, was mentioned. And we're very, very, very short Sorry. on time, so it would be great if you come back another time yeah, and we can good. have another Sorry. discussion. But, Francis, we've, very we've final word got to you. the lowest corporation tax in the G7 mm. and the lowest growth and the lowest um, increases in wages. So I don't think that's been a great prescription. But the Chancellor didn't answer. How is lifting the cap on bankers' bonuses and driving down nurses' and teachers' pay and attacking workers' rights, how is that going to help build growth? And if we want fair growth, you have to build that on decent jobs and strong rights okay, for working people. OK, we must people. leave it there. All three of you, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I think it's going to be a pretty testy party conference season and maybe a pretty testy few months because in the last 60 minutes, it's been obvious, hasn't it, that the gap between our two big political parties is getting wider. 
the difference between how they'd run the economy is getting greater. The government's accused by many of taking major risks with the country's livelihood. But the Chancellor just told me this is the start. There will be more measures to come. Keir Starmer said he would reverse some, but not all of the measures the government has taken. These aren't just the early skirmishes, but I think the shape of the argument that is going to run at full pelt all the way to the next election. Of course, we'll be here every week to talk about all of that. And next week, we'll hear from the Prime Minister herself in Birmingham, explain more of what's next for the country and more of her vision. You can catch up with anything you missed today on the iPlayer. Hope to see you next week in Birmingham. Goodbye.